I just wanted to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and to pay respects to elders uh, past and, and present. And thank you so much for um, inviting me to, to be here, to learn from what you're doing and um, to share a little bit of what we're doing in the UK um, to see if there are some linkages there or, um, or if it just helps to reflect on some of the things that you're doing now, some of the things that you're really proud of, uh, maybe some of the things that you want to do in future together as you uh, think about future phases of the, uh, of the centre. Uh, I'm from a city in um, England called Birmingham, in the middle of England. And if people have been to uh, the UK before, you know it's just the back end of our winter. Uh, and winters in England are famously pleasant and dry. <laughs> um, so imagine my surprise when I got off the plane in Melbourne at 10 o'clock in the evening on Sunday, and it was 37 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm trying to go to an Aussie rules game on Sunday before I, before I head back at, at the MCG, but the game is in the middle of the day uh, when it starts to get hot again. And so I've had to email the ground to find out which parts of the stand are in the most shade and um, to see whether I'm allowed to bring in sun cream and water and extra coverings and maybe some replacement salts and minerals and uh, possibly a mobile operating theatre. Um, so I don't think I've done anything to dispel stereotypes of POMs as not being very robust. <laughs> On to more important things, um, or maybe not more important than football, but, but important in a different kind of way. Um, Impact is a, a UK centre for using evidence in adult social care. And I just wanted to share a little bit about the journey that we've been on and to reflect on some of what we've been thinking around, around evidence, uh, around co-production and around implementation in particular. Uh, to see if it's helpful uh, for the debates that you're having. And um, I subtitled this, uh, you'll make a good social worker, the trouble is you think too much. And this was something that was said to me when I was a social work student out on placement. It was said by someone uh, who meant it kindly and who went on to be quite senior in uh, public services in the, in the UK. But they said, you'll make a good social worker, John, the trouble is you think too much. And now I know what they meant. Um, I was probably a very irritating student. Um, you, you can't ask too many questions, can you? And, and you, you kind of sometimes you have to earn the right to ask questions. And you have to ask questions in the way that the other person can hear. Um, but deep down, I think the young and very naive me was trying to say, why are things the way they are? Could they be different? And could I play a role in that? Uh, and those are questions that I hope we would all ask of ourselves in our own practice, whatever. Uh, experiences we bring or whatever position we occupy in the system and the way it was framed was really interesting you think too much with something uh, as as important as adult social care in my case mental health in your case with something that, that touches people's lives in such fundamental intimate ways um, how could you ever possibly think too much about it uh, I also wonder whether it's something that we would have said to a different kind of welfare professional um, you know, would we have said it to a junior doctor, uh, for example? They might be equally irritating, uh, but actually thinking is kind of quite an important part of the role. The next time someone operates on your cancer, you kind of want her to be thinking about it a bit before she does it. Um, you know, thinking is quite an important part of practice. So in our country, there's often been a divide between doing stuff, practice, and then researching it and thinking about it and exploring it, research. And they've been two separate worlds with, with different people in each camp uh, finding it quite difficult to talk to each other and to uh, to build uh, meaningful relationships. And for me, those two things have always been or should be two sides of the, the same coin. And I suspect that Alive uh, has very similar uh, views. So IMPACT, the centre that I lead, uh, it stands for Improving Adult Care Together. And it's the UK centre for implementing evidence in adult social care. We were really fortunate that two of our national funders came together to put up uh, 15 million pounds, so I guess that's about 30 million Australian dollars, uh, over seven years to create, a, to identify a, a leadership team and a director that would design and deliver a UK centre for implementing evidence in adult social care. And one of them was a very traditional uh, academic research funder in the social sciences at the Economic and Social Research Council, the ESRC. And the other was a charitable health foundation um, called the Health Foundation that fund a lot of improvement work in our health service, but had done a lot less in, in adult social care previously. And we were very fortunate to be able to put together a consortium that bid for and then uh, won this national tender to design and to deliver the centre. 
And when I talk about adult social care uh, in the UK, that means a series of services that help adults with uh, activities of daily living. It could be getting, um, getting up in the morning, getting washed, getting dressed, uh, going to the toilet, getting fed, uh, getting out, uh, being meaningfully occupied during the day, uh, being safe from abuse and neglect, as well as the support that's provided to friends and families who are providing unpaid care and support uh, to people who are using services. So it might refer to older people or younger disabled people, uh, people with learning disabilities, people with mental health problems, um, and, and so on. So it's, a, it's that kind of sector that I'm um, talking about when I say adult social care. It's kind of kind of broader than what you do with the detail of your focus on mental health, but it, I guess it's got quite a lot of parallels. Um, and we work across the whole of the UK. Now, the UK is a really small country, but it's divided up into four nations uh, with a, quite a, a degree of devolution down to some of those nations. Uh, and very proud and, and long-standing traditions and cultures in those different nations. So we've got Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and, and England. So we try to be really based in uh, and kind of rooted in the realities of those different policy and practice contexts, whilst also sharing some of the lessons that we've learned across those boundaries across the UK as a whole. An impact is uh, an implementation center, not a research center. So it's about taking evidence that already exists and then getting it used in practice to make a difference to services and to people's lives. Uh, I know you're a research translation center, but this is at the sort of far end of the translation end of it. It's, um, you know, Phil's tool yesterday was fantastic. I, I guess you could launch that on the world and someone would use it brilliantly and someone would use it terribly and someone wouldn't use it at all. How do you take a wonderful tool like that and get people actually using it in the way that it was intended to make the difference that's kind of intended to to have it's kind of taking great stuff and, and kind of actually getting it used in practice to, to try and make a difference. And when we talk about evidence of what works, we've got quite a broad and an inclusive definition of evidence, um, which I think is very similar to the debates that you have within Alive. So we're referring to insights from different types of research, to insights from the lived experience of people who draw on care and support or who are carers and insights from the practice knowledge of people who work in adult social care. And we'd see those three ways of knowing the world, uh, research, lived experience, and practice knowledge, uh, as different but potentially complementary. And you kind of need to bring them together to, to triangulate. Uh, but then also just to kind of work with in practical terms as you're bringing people together from different backgrounds to work on hopefully common solutions to, to common uh, problems. Now, there's some philosophical and some practical issues around how you do that for real, which I'll come on to a, a bit later. Uh, but in adult social care, that definition of evidence is probably very different to uh, some forms of knowledge in other sectors, um, in some of our more clinical health um, settings, um, for example. We've got four delivery models that impact our demonstrators, our facilitators, our networks, and our Ask Impact team. And I'll say a little bit about those, not, not because I think the detail will be of, of interest necessarily, but to give you a flavor of the, the kind of way in which we, we work. And then we also have a linked concept, which I'll say a bit more about, called national embedding. So when we've done a local project in a local service or an area, we try and work out what it is we've learned about the topic and then we try and find ways of um, getting that built into national policy and practice so that we scale innovation, not just by telling people about it, although we do do that, but also by trying to get it built into how adult social care gets done in, in, in future, a sort of active process of embedding. Uh, and I was really interested in the debates that you were having yesterday about kind of working at scale and about scaling deep. Uh, uh, and so on. Uh, our version of that is, is around our notion of um, uh, national embedding. And again, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But for us, it's really, really crucial because without that, all we'd be is a series of interesting projects that would stop when the funding stopped. We wouldn't be greater than the sum of our, our parts. Uh, our funders have given us four key aims. It's to increase the use of evidence in adult social care to, to lead to better uh, care and better outcomes. In the process, it's about building capacity and skills in the workforce to, to work with evidence. Crucially, and very similar to Alive, it's about developing relationships between a, a range of different people in a sector that is very fragmented, uh, very contested, and where there's very few shared spaces. Um, 
and then also in the process to improve our understanding of what helps and what hinders when you're trying to use evidence in practice in adult social care might be really similar to, to other sectors that we know more about. It might be completely different. Um, it might be somewhere in between. You know, nobody knows, but we will do by the end of the, uh, the centre. This is a really busy slide and probably more detail than you need, but to, to just talk you through our four delivery models is to give you a flavour of the kind of way we work. So for big strategic change issues, we have a series of what we call impact demonstrators. And those are a pair of very senior colleagues who are, um, their job title is strategic improvement coaches, um, who work together in a local service or a system over 12 months to, to lead an evidence-informed change project, normally quite a big, quite a complicated, quite a multi-agency uh, evidence-informed change project. And the coaches are from a range of different backgrounds, but they often bring organizational development change management, leadership, consultancy, uh, facilitation kind of skills. They're, they're ap applied practitioners and leaders. They're not research fellows or senior research fellows in university. So it's a completely different job description and a completely different skill set, um, potentially. And so those coaches would work together to, um, to lead a year-long evidence-informed change project. So at the moment, we've got all of our councils across one of the regions in England working together on a demonstrator that is looking at uh, co-designing new ways of managing waiting uh, lists in adult social care. Uh, Post-COVID, there have been massive waiting lists built up. And our councils are sitting on loads of risk because they've got loads of people on waiting lists that they know nothing about because they're just waiting to be, to be seen. It's awful if you're on the receiving end as a person or as a family. And it's pretty rubbish if you're a frontline member of staff having to kind of front that up and, and kind of manage it when you had no responsibility for kind of creating it in the first place. Now that's a really, really difficult set of circumstances, but are there some insights from the evidence, either from adult social care or indeed from other sectors, that we could bring to, in that region, design a better way of managing that very, very different issue that is more co-produced between those different groups and that works better for, for each of them. Uh, a second one is looking at how do you create integrated neighbourhood teams at, at a very, very local level. And there we've got, um, uh, three projects actually in uh, three different nations of the UK all working on the same issue so they're, they're doing the work in their local area uh, but they've not got those opportunities to share learning across three of the four nations. So that's just to give you a kind of flavour, it's, th it's those kinds of issues and topics and, and kind of scales that we're talking about with our impact demonstrators. Our impact facilitators are, are smaller and more bounded. The, the facilitator is a single person, a more junior colleague working for 12 months in a frontline agency to try and lead a, a more bounded, more bottom-up, evidence-informed change project. Uh, so a colleague at the moment, for example, is looking at how do you recruit more men into to care work. Uh, our workforce is about 80-20 in terms of uh, women to men. Uh, we need to recruit more men into care work, and it raises a series of practical issues, uh, and more fundamentally, a series of issues about, about masculinity and, and, and care and about equality. Uh, so that colleague is working in a frontline service provider to look at how they recruit and retain staff um, and whether the scope for them to draw on the evidence. Uh, there's not very much in adult social care. Most of what we've got comes from nursing, actually, which has had similar debates. Uh, and can that agency apply that evidence to uh, recruit more men um, over the course of the, the project? And um, they'll go wherever the evidence takes them. So uh, one of the things it's suggesting at the moment is that um, sometimes it, it's too late by the time you're starting to try and recruit men. You kind of need to be working with young boys in schools to be thinking about care as a career. So that uh, worker will probably go into local schools to design a package to, to work with young boys. And if that's really good, we'll try and turn that into some sort of national resource that's available. Well, generally, it's a really sort of practical, applied, hands-on form of working with, with evidence, if that helps to uh, bring it to life a little bit. Uh, another person is um, trying to develop um, preventative visits for people uh, at a particular age, it might be 75, in a part of Northern Ireland, whether the scope for the system to reach out to people at a particular age, to take stock of where, how things are going, and to help people plan ahead more proactively in terms of um, future care and support um, needs. And is there a way of building that into local services so that they're kind of more proactively reaching out to people rather than waiting till someone's in a crisis and then and then dealing with the, uh, the crisis. Just as two examples to, to make that a little bit more concrete. 
uh, for complex but everyday practice issues, our impact networks um, create, um, form a series of groups all over the UK, um, all working on the same practical issue in their local area in a really kind of hands-on way. They're made up of people who draw on care and support, carers, practitioners and managers, and there's some sort of local uh, leader, often a manager, but maybe from a community organisation, who is the kind of local convener of that group. And they get some stimulus material from us to start them off. And then they go through quite a structured way of meeting and feeding back over six months, uh, how they measured up against the evidence, uh, what they've started to do in response, what barriers they faced, how they got round it, what they plan to do next, and so on. And after each meeting, a summary of that gets sent in to us and we collate it across all the groups and then send it back out again before the next meeting so that the group itself is doing its thing in its, in its own area in a way that works for them. But the learning is kind of scaling across the UK uh, over time in a really kind of bottom up um, kind of way. And at the moment, we've got topics around uh, supporting older people to come out of hospital, uh, around delivering services. In, <laughs> I was laughing with somebody last night, but delivering services in rural areas. And I realised that people from the UK can't really talk about isolated <laughs> rural areas when our country is tiny. But, but some parts of the UK, UK feel rural to, 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 to me, even if you describe them as a metropolis, I suspect. Um, someone was teasing me as well about um, an Australian colleague, just as an aside, who'd come to visit, was really amused about our road signs, where in a rural area, you often see a sign to the next village, and it would say, well, this village is two miles away. And they'd say, why would you waste a sign on something that's two miles away? If it's two miles away, you can see it. You know, <laughs> like in my, where I come from, they said, and they were quite inland, you know, you'd say next village, 150 miles or something, but you wouldn't have a, a sign that said two miles. So, um, yeah, our rural social care uh, network probably wasn't a very good example for, for current colleagues. <laughs> Um, another one is around um, how do you help people with learning disabilities or autistic people uh, come out of long stay, secure uh, forensic settings, for example, and lead more ordinary lives in the community. And that may be one that speaks more to the, the work of a life. And then finally, our Ask Impact service identifies kind of, kind of hot topics in adult social care. And then it produces um, rigorous but, but really practical and simple guides to help people just grapple with those issues. Um, so the first one that we did was around recruitment and, retain, and retention of staff in adult social care and there's large numbers of vacancies and the guide really just says this is a nightmare for everybody, nobody really knows the answer but the evidence suggests that there's four or five things that, that might make a little bit of a difference um, or with a couple of them there's not even that much evidence but everyone seems to be doing them anyway so it may be worth you thinking about them. Here they are, boom, 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 boom and here's some practical examples of people who are doing it and that's the guide. It's just trying to distill these really complex, challenging issues down into, into some stuff that you can rely on as much as is possible, but, but, but that is just kind of doable if you're a busy manager trying to recruit staff. You haven't got time to search for a systematic review on recruitment and retention of staff. You just need some stuff that might, might help you if you're trying to do that a little bit differently or a little bit better. So those are our four delivery models and hopefully there may be too much detail there around either topics or models, but, but, but the, what I was trying to get across was the, the kind of very practical, applied, hands-on nature of the, the work. The evidence already exists. It's helping people think about it, then do something in response to it that, that it, to me, is the hard bit. Um, and I was always uh, working as a social worker and then at a university. I was always a little bit too academic for, for practice, and I was way too practical for academia. And, um, and somewhere like Impact just gave me somewhere that would like indulge both sides of my personality and rather than being weaknesses in either sector, kind of a strength somewhere in between the, the two. And I think Alive has probably got aspirations to, to, to do something similar. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so I'll, some of the topics that have struck me from yesterday and from kind of contacts in advance were around some of what we're doing around evidence, around co-production and around implementation. So I wanted to focus in on, a, on those in a bit more detail, not because I think we've got any, any answers here, but, but just because I think they're debates that you're having as well. And, and you know, either we might have some thoughts that could be useful. And even if they're not, sometimes just hearing someone else talk about it in a different context gives you a kind of some questions and a lens to think about your own, your own stuff. Uh, one of the things we're really proud about is our approach to evidence. And as I said earlier, we define evidence as including insights from research, from lived experience, and from, from practice knowledge. 
And with all the work that we did as part of our co-design stage, that landed really, really well in adult social care. Um, but people said some forms of research, well, they said research, and then they cl clarified it to some forms of research, and they meant more economic forms of research, are already quite powerful when we have debates about what services should look like. Now, they're important in their own right, those forms of knowledge. But if you're working with research, lived experience, and practice knowledge, then A, it needs to be a range of different types of evidence, uh, depending on the topic. But B, if you needed to turn up the volume on any of those three things, it might be turning the volume up on lived experience and practice knowledge so that they're a little bit more recognized and valued than they are now, alongside research, which is really important, but to an extent is, al is already relatively recognized in some circles. So research, lived experience, and practice knowledge, but maybe needing to, to turn the volume up on lived experience and practice knowledge. And it was really interesting to see your principles around, you know, Michelle talked yesterday about lived experience being woven into the fabric of the, the centre. You've got your emphasis on um, practice wisdom uh, and so on. It's a very, very similar uh, set of debates. And um, there are lo long-standing debates in the UK about um, so-called hierarchies of evidence, uh, about which if you're not careful can descend into debates about is one form of evidence better, inherently better than, a, than another. Um, and we've argued, I think, um, in the past and through impact that, that there often isn't a best approach. It kind of depends what you want to know as to what a good way of finding it out is. So, you know, if you wanted to take a new drug or a new procedure, or you had a new intervention that you wanted to, to, to test, like why would you want to take a drug that hadn't been tested through a series of randomized controlled trials and, and systematic reviews, unless it was a really, really experimental, you know, but, but, but what, you know, it just works really, really well. And, um, and there's loads of folk who are just really, really uh, good at it. Um, if you wanted to know, I don't know, what it felt like to be uh, what we call sectioned and ad ad forcibly admitted to a mental health hospital, um, again, potentially against your will and to have your rights taken away, you, you might try and find out that out by talking to people who've been sectioned and their families, by talking to people who've done the sectioning. You might want to try and observe some sections to see in quite a structured way to see what it was like. Now, you may then design an intervention to do sectioning differently that you could test with the randomized controlled trial or other ways of working. But it depends what you want to know as to, to what a good way of finding it out is. Now, that sounds really, really basic, but every, and everyone's nodding in the the room, but I suspect that the academics in the room have preferences for particular approaches and sort of stuff they're good at. And so they tend to default to those when they get confronted with a, a sort of an issue. I know I do it. I, just, I think, oh, we could do something on X. Well, a really good way to do it would be the way I normally do stuff, <laughs> rather than thinking through, well, what's a really good way of answering that, that question? And one of the wonderful things that you've got is the, the kind of just the depth and the breadth of the resources in the room and online. There's, you know, just from having met some of your methodology colleagues, there's no question that you couldn't answer, I suspect, with the breadth of, uh, of expertise, uh, lived experience and practice knowledge that you have uh, available to you. But it does depend what you want to know as to what's a good way of finding it out is. And we've also found in the UK that, that there's been quite a debate historically about um, different principles uh, of, of evidence. And some of our methods uh, and randomized controlled trials are a good example, often involve being um, quite objective in inverted commas, because I'm not sure anything's objective really, but, but quite distant uh, from the topic that you're researching so, so that you can be really dispassionate and, and neutral and you can be really clear and transparent that, that as little as possible about you uh, or, the, or the setting is kind of getting in the way of, of, of what you're finding. The sort of distance and the objectivity is really, really important. There are other research traditions that say that that works really well for some things, but that other times being really, really close to the thing that you're trying to understand really helps you actually understand it. And that the further you are away from it, that the more scope there is for misunderstanding to, uh, to occur. And some forms of feminist research and disability led research in particular have emphasized actually being close to and understanding the thing rather than being distant from an objective about it really, really matters. Uh, and again, just kind of working with the reality of those different traditions. And, and I'm kind of exaggerating to make a, 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 a point, uh, a, a, as it were. But there are these debates about, about being distant and being close to something. And of course, you, you kind of need both for, in different blends for, for different kind of things. 
Now, all this probably sounds really dry. It's almost like a philosophy <laughs> lecture, isn't it? But, but it's really, really important because really it's a debate about which voices get heard when we talk about these things and then which voices get um, edited out of the, the process. So it's actually a debate about power that's just playing out through a series of debates about, about knowledge and about, about research. It's really about whose voices get heard and whose voices don't. Um, and these things can be um, fundamentally important. I did a big study just at the start of my career for, um, we were setting up a new National Institute for Mental Health uh, in England. And it was the first big study that they'd um, commissioned. And they wanted a series of guides to what works in adult mental health um, services for um, service managers and, and funders. Um, and it ended up as a kind of collection of booklets about different parts of our system from sort of primary care to community services to hospital to forensics as well as on themes like involvement and discrimination and, uh, 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 and families and, and, and so on. And um, we adopted an approach which was probably philosophically quite similar to the, the approach that IMPACT has, trying to, trying to include insights from research, from lived experience and from practice knowledge. And um, we produced the, the material for the National Institute. It seemed to go really well. Then we started to write it up and send it off to academic journals and this was very early on in my my career and um, we got three or four responses from three or four very different journals and some journals hated it and I mean hated it with a passion I got some really really horrible reviews kind of vitriolic yeah horrible horrible reviews and then some other reviews really really loved it I mean beyond all proportion like loved it and and after a while you become a bit more experienced and you think well hang on if, if like the views are that polarized I'm not sure it's the actual stuff that people are arguing about here, because the actual stuff is all right. It's kind of, you know, you'd either like it or you wouldn't, but it was fine. Um, if it's generating such different responses, there's something else going on here that isn't just about, is this a well-written article or not? And it's actually a debate about these kinds of things, about research, lived experience, about practice knowledge, about being distant, about being close. It's a debate about power and about whose voices get heard. And uh, one of the uh, psychiatric journals in particular um, responded to a, something we'd written about hospital services. And at the time, there was a real uh, crisis in mental health hospital um, care in, in England. And a lot of people saying, including people that work in uh, hospitals, but a lot of people saying that they felt they got better in spite of hospital rather than, than because of it, that it was actually a very difficult place for them to be. They didn't feel very safe. Uh, and a lot of staff saying similar. Uh, and a lot of observational studies of other people who come into hospitals to try and sort of document what was, what was happening, identifying similar, similar kind of themes. Uh, but it's a particular kind of literature written from a particular kind of standpoint. I remember one of the, the uh, reviewers when they responded saying, this is all very interesting, but if it's not in a randomized controlled trial, I refuse to believe it's true. <laughs> and, and again, I was quite genius. So I was a little bit kind of it shook my confidence a little bit. And then after a while, I thought, well, there's loads of stuff that's not in a randomized controlled trial, but that I'd still argue is true. I don't. Uh, and then also, if we kind of refuse to acknowledge anything that isn't in a kind of pre-preferred format, then, then do we close our minds to some stuff that's really important? And my preference would have been to say, is there some stuff going on about the quality of care being delivered in some of our hospitals? And if so, can we do something about it, rather than get into a philosophical debate about different forms of evidence? So this is, this is dry stuff, if you let it be. But, but actually, these are fundamental issues about, about power, about life, about death. That, that really, really matter, and it's to do with whose voices get, get heard. And I know that these debates are really live across the different disciplines and uh, parts of the system that you have represented through, um, through Alive. Uh, what I would say is when you make a series of statements like the ones I've made, uh, uh, and everyone was nodding, it was really nice, um, you then need to back it up with practical ways of working. So, so that's great, John, but how do you actually do it uh, for real is, is, is you know, a fairly reasonable challenge. And, you know, without going into too much detail here, when we're looking at the evidence, we've got a way of reviewing quite a broad range of materials. And then it put, depending on the type of material, um, it, this is all online, it pulls down a series of prompts for the reviewer to, uh, to critique uh, and to, to quality assure what they're reading. Uh, but they pull down different prompts and, and quality criteria depending on the type of material it is. So for a randomized controlled trial, you'd, you'd read it and scrutinize it and take a view on its quality in a particular kind of way. For an observational study, you'd do it in a different kind of way. For something that was based on a series of accounts uh, from lived experience, you'd, you'd have a different series of prompts and so on. So the process kind of makes you think about quality and, and about how much you can trust what you're, you're reading or what you can take away from it. 
uh, but, but, but tailors that according to the type of material it is. Uh, and then the process prompts the reviewer as well to think about what kind of insights are we getting here from different forms of research, from lived experience and from practice knowledge, and also to what extent are issues of equality, diversity and inclusion built into some of what we're seeing here. And it makes those gaps um, really, really explicit. Now, where there are key gaps, we can still work with the topic, but it prompts our delivery staff to, to be really mindful of that. So I might go ahead with my project on recruiting more men into care, but I'm doing that knowing that I've got a limited evidence base and it's got these kind of gaps and it comes from these kind of places, but it doesn't speak very well to these kinds of forms of knowledge. And I can work even harder in the project to try and compensate for some of those gaps because I, I know that the evidence base I've got is skewed and is partial. Um, so that's probably as much detail about sort of methods and, uh, and so on as people are, are possibly interested in. But, but you do need to back up these statements about what evidence is with practical ways of actually kind of working with it. Uh, otherwise, you end up in a situation where someone's got an approach and the academic goes, yeah, but it's just a bit more complicated than that, isn't it? Which isn't always a very helpful <laughs> response unless you can then back it up with some kind of way of working with the, the complexity. Um, Co-production and lived experience is really, really important to us. And we uh, adopt a definition from a, a national organization called the Social Care Institute for Excellence, which is, tries to uh, identify what works in, in adult social care. Uh, and they describe co-production as people who draw on care and support and carers working with professionals in equal partnerships towards uh, shared goals. And they have a kind of jigsaw model uh, of co-production, which you can find online that helps you think about the kind of structure of what you're doing, about the kind of culture of what you're doing, about your practice, and then builds in a really kind of active review um, process. Uh, and we found that quite helpful, not least because co-production gets used so often to mean so many different things that it's almost lost any of its original meaning. And unless you just go back and check that you're all meaning the, the, the same thing by the same um, term. And we've tried to build lived experience into everything that we, we do. So, so it's built into our definition of evidence, which you know, I think is an important thing in its own right. Uh, it's built into our staff team. 52% of our staff say that they've got a lived experience of adult social care. And that includes all our sort of professional services and administrative and financial and, and communications roles, as well as our kind of more delivery focused roles. So across the center, 52% of, of staff say they have lived experience. Um, it's built into our leadership team and our governance um, and it's also now built into the governance of our funders and what was really interesting when we first started uh, our funders had a kind of oversight group that didn't have lived experience uh, on it. it had everyone else but not lived experience and it was our co-production advisory group from within the center that said well hang on if you're building lived experience into everything that you're doing shouldn't that include how the, the govern how the funders are held to account as well and we've got really really good funders who a were able to hear that when we set it back uh, and then b acted on it and made sure that lived experience was built into their oversight group going forwards in, in a really meaningful um way so i thought that was a really lovely example of, of just kind of dialogue and you know kind of working through things uh together uh, we've got then lived experience built into a series of impact assemblies and we have one each in wales scotland and northern ireland and then two in england uh, and those are groups of about 40 people, I guess. And they're made up of people who draw on care and support, carers, service providers, managers, uh, researchers, and national, national bodies. So rather than having a single kind of advisory group of the, of the great and the good, if I can put it like that, we've got these five slightly more kind of nationally based, more regionally based bodies that are perhaps a bit closer to the realities of people's lives and the realities of local practice. Still, a degree of distance but a, but a bit a bit closer maybe providing more bottom-up um, support uh, and challenge uh, and then the people who draw on care and support and the carers from those assemblies uh, suggest uh, two people from each assembly who then form an additional co-production advisory uh, group which is an extra body to provide additional support and additional challenge to help us live up to our principles and our values when it comes to lived experience and, um, and co-production. So, so like a lot of these things, it has to be built into everything, I think. And then it also needs its own focus and care and attention and support and resource. Otherwise saying, well, it's built into everything becomes a bit of a cop-out unless you're making sure that it genuinely 
is. So it's kind of both and rather than either or. If like, you know, but equally, we don't want a co-production advisory group that does the co-production, then nothing else has lived experience built into it. It's got to run throughout everything as well as having its own specialist focus and attention and, um, and ability to, to, to challenge um, back. Um, hardly surprisingly, and I think you, you think the same, we've learned that the key things there are about time uh, and about relationships and kind of making progress together, you know, giving something a go, doing your best, taking stock, being really honest about what has and hasn't worked, listening to diverse voices, trying to do it a bit better next time and just making progress. There's no right answer or there's no, you've never cracked it, it's just a kind of journey that you're you're on together, uh, I guess, and uh, and that just takes time, and it takes relationships, and it takes trust, and it takes honesty, and uh, it takes an ability to be a little bit prickly, and for that still to be okay, you know, to use your metaphor from uh, for, from yesterday. These are these are just about people. But one of our co-production advisory groups said to me, John, isn't this just about people trying to help people? And you know, maybe we need to do a bit better, and we will do a bit better. I just thought that was quite a nice <laughs> way of um, taking all the complexity out of the. Uh, at the argument really. Um, it's also though about power. So when I facilitate one of our assemblies, I've got these really diverse groups um, and we have to work really hard to make sure that as many different voices get heard as possible and that everyone feels comfortable participating in whatever way works for them. And that's, that, that's just like a constant process um, that you're, you're going through. So uh, one guy uh, on the assembly that I co-chair, for example, um, his speech is quite impaired, uh, particularly on online, and um, so it is quite difficult for people to, to understand what he's trying to, to say. So we've got funding for either his personal assistant or sometimes it's his mum, uh, and he says what he wants to say, and then his mum, who is really sort of tuned in to his speech, you know, also says it so, so that other people get it, uh, as well as him being able to uh, to say and she's funded to, to do that because obviously it's a time commitment and we're relying on on her time and her um, her commitment uh, someone else uh, didn't feel comfortable saying anything in front of um, professionals and, uh, and managers uh, and again she, her speech is quite um, probably quite slow I would say online she just reflects on everything in the meeting she doesn't say anything she just listens and then she emails me a couple of days later with all her thoughts in response to what she's heard and we make sure that that's woven back into the, the summary that goes uh, back out because that just kind of works for her and then at the last assembly she was the first person that put up a hand and said something live online in front of everybody else and it was just one of those moments where you thought you know what this kind of feels like we've created a space where where it's possible to make progress together you know that doesn't get rid of the power imbalance or be naive about it it's all kinds of barriers still to go but actually we've we've started to build relationships in a way that people are feeling a bit more comfortable saying what they're actually thinking with each other and that's part of the part of the process and then we've also found ourselves being a real critical friend to the, the system. So as we're working with um, different localities or services, um, we work with people who draw on care and support carers, practitioners and, uh, and, and managers. And our assumption was there'll be a series of existing networks and mechanisms that we can broadly tap into in those local areas. We might need to supplement and do extra things, but actually there'll be a kind of infrastructure out there. And as we went out and about around the country, we found that it was really, really variable, depending on who you were working with and where, and that sometimes it was really, really patchy, and that some of the conversations and the mechanisms that you would assume were there weren't always there in, in practice. And so slightly by accident, we found that we ended up with a really important critical friend role, um, supporting those areas to think about ways of doing things a bit differently, kind of modeling it by, by sort of encouraging it and, and, and supporting it. Sometimes calling it out and saying, do you know what, I'm not sure that's good enough. You know, if you do, I know you don't do that here, but actually the place next door does it a bit like this. Do you want me to introduce you so that you can have that conversation together? And I wonder whether our sort of indirect role as a critical friend back to some of the people who host our projects will end up almost as important as the actual project itself in the, the fullness of time. I'll, I'll struggle to evidence that, but, but I've, I've kind of seen it. And, and, and I, it, it's just making a difference, I think, through being a critical friend to the system. And sometimes you just hold a mirror up to stuff, don't you? And it helps people reflect. And then as long as that's done in a supportive way and, and people have got some, somewhere to go to then work with whatever they've seen when they've looked back in the, the, the mirror, you've got a way of, of, of making progress uh, together. So again, I was struck by what you were saying about your projects and the way that you work. And my guess is that you make a similar 
indirect contribution to some of the debates that you pitch into and some of the places that, that, that you work. And there's probably something really important about celebrating that and articulating it and, and seeing it as a contribution in, it, in its own right, because I suspect it really, really matters. Um, there's then some reflections on implementation. As I say, we're an implementation centre, uh, not a research centre. So this is core to, to us. But people told us at the start that they've got policy that tells them what they ought to be doing. And they've got research, which is more or less helpful in giving them some ideas about things that might be fruitful. But the really difficult bit was actually doing it for real, you know, in practice, in the reality of frontline services, in, in a very difficult context. I know what policy tells me on how you should be doing, John. I've got the research that shows me what might help, but how do I actually do it? And how do I, how do, I do it in the wrong part of Canberra on a Friday afternoon when it's, when it's raining? You know, that degree of, of, of kind of granularity. Um, and adult social care has never had very much of that practical support. Uh, but what there was was lost in our country during the austerity agenda that, that several governments have pursued because we focused on preserving frontline services you know, quite rightly. But the stuff that got cut was the training budgets, the research budgets, the kind of quality improvement stuff, you know, all those kind of supports that, that help you take a step back and reflect and do things differently. There were never very many of them to start off with, but it was those that were decimated because we were trying to do what, whatever we could just to preserve as much frontline um, support as, as possible. So, so, that, so all our delivery models really are geared up to providing practical support. And I'd, I'd see a manager of a residential home and say, I know what I'm doing isn't good enough, but I don't know what to, how to do it any differently. And even if I did, I haven't got the time or the headspace to work out how to do it. If I had somebody alongside me that could, could help me reflect, could show me, could help me go about doing it, and then could help me work out what has and hasn't worked and how I need to change it going forward, I'd do it like a shot. But I need somebody to help me. So a lot of the models are based on that kind of very practical, hands-on support, um, learning by doing, um, if, if you like, which is very different to traditional research and to, to traditional uh, policy in the, in the UK. I said earlier, but it requires a completely different skill set. There might be some academics who are good at that, that kind of stuff. Hopefully I'm an all right academic and I'm all right at some of this kind of, kind of stuff. But but often they're very, very specialist skills, you know, being an academic or, or being in this kind of space. And, and, and they're just different job descriptions and, and you're trying to recruit from a different pool of um, people. And we've had to work really hard uh, at that, not least with our university partners who keep trying to turn it back into more traditional academic uh, roles. So I'll have a job description that goes through the HR committee and then it will, you know, it will come back with, that's really interesting, John, but it doesn't mention anything about peer review articles. <laughs> It's like, yes, that's because we don't want these people to write <laughs> peer review articles, and they'd be crap at it if we asked them to. We want them to be in workplaces and help people do things differently in response to the evidence. It's just a completely different role. So, so we've all got these lenses, haven't we? And because and we're trying to kind of span a series of different worlds, we're trying to, to, to kind of do things a bit, a bit differently. We've got this approach to, to um, trying to scale innovation, uh, you know, our version of scaling deep, uh, if you like, through what we call national embedding. And really that's around trying to build relationships with policymakers, with uh, regulators, with educational bodies, professional bodies, membership organizations, some of the practice improvement intermediary type organizations that you often get. So that some of the lessons that we learn can get built into how adult social care gets done. So the project that I mentioned earlier around managing waiting lists in adult social care, the chief executive of one of our regulators in one of the four nations, said, if you do that project, John, and if it produces the kind of learning that we think it will produce, we'll build it into our methodology for how we inspect all local councils in our nation, because it's such a fundamental issue. Now, it's easy to say that, will they, in, in reality, when the project finishes, chances are that person won't be the chief executive by the time the project finishes, because you know, in our country, anyway, you have a shelf life in these kind of roles and things can change very, very quickly. If you built it into the regulations, it would only make so much difference because you know, you've got to obey the regulator, but there's ways and means of looking like you're obeying the regulator without actually obeying the, the regulator. But still, if it was built in, then, then people would have to engage with those lessons, not just because they wanted to, although I'm sure they will, and not just because we told them about it, although we will, but because it's built into the methodology of how services get inspected and, and kind of judged as satisfactory um, or, or not. So that's just an example, but are there ways of, of taking stuff that we know makes a difference 
and then scaling it through, not just through telling people about it, but through getting it built into how stuff gets done, uh, for example. Um, in doing that, we're a small centre. I mean, £15 million pounds is, is, for adult social care, is unheard of. I mean, it's, adult social care has never had that much money to do this kind of stuff in its history in the, in the UK. I was going to say it feels like a once in a generation opportunity to make a difference, but it's more than once in a generation. It's just unheard of. And yet, you know, when you spread 15 million over four nations over seven years, it, it doesn't actually go very, very far, which probably sounds incredibly churlish when you say it like that. But it, you know, the ambition is massive, but the, but the reality is quite, quite constrained. And actually, it's something that our health service would spend on a small region of, of England in, you know, in a two years or something like that. that that's the degree of disparity. So we have to be really targeted and really focused because we just haven't got the capacity to do anything else. Uh, and all that we've learned and been advised around is that around this ad, an embedding gender in particular, you have to be really strategic about what you think will make the, the biggest difference, really focused and really planned. And, and, and slightly confusingly, you have to be highly opportunistic and flexible <laughs> because sometimes stuff just happens, doesn't it? That you, there's an opportunity that you didn't see that just emerges, a window opens up and you've got to like, be in the right place at the right time and kind of go for it. Otherwise it closes down and you've missed Miss the opportunity. So how can you be highly strategic whilst also massively opportunistic and flexible at the same time? And some of it is about having the right relationships. Um, it was described to, to us by one of our funders actually as just being on the call sheet for, for some of the right people. Um, you know, there'll be a general election sometime this year in, in the UK. We don't know what will happen. We can guess, but we don't know. Actually, it's really important that we're on the call sheet for whoever is the next care services uh, minister um, after that that election and, and kind of being on the call sheet as a metaphor is almost more important than having a strategy in advance for we're going to focus on these three things and you know because they're key gaps and so on we've got all that but actually I might have to ditch one of them and just do something else entirely differently if if the world suddenly changed and um, and we had the opportunity to, to kind of go for something um, and some of it's luck, isn't it? And yet at the same time, you kind of make your own luck a little bit as well. So, so being on the call sheet, being strategic and opportunistic, that, 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 that having that kind of flexibility, but the plan, I think is, um, and, and actually I was struck by what Hamish was saying about being organized enough, actually, you know, with some of the kind of community development work, you need the organization, but you need the flexibility to go where it takes you and, and it needs to be organized just enough. And, and maybe our national embedding is a bit like that uh, as well. Uh, certainly the, the early um, example we've had where we've made the biggest progress was the one where I nearly ditched it because I thought we were going to make no progress at all. Um, and I won't go into details as to which one that, <laughs> that was or which nation it was, but it looked like nothing was going to happen. The political system was in gridlock. The agenda was just nowhere near the, the top. Nothing was going on. Everyone was cross with each other. Actually, through a bit of perseverance and relationship building and flexibility, suddenly a load of stuff became possible in that nation around that particular topic. And the fact that it was at rock bottom meant that there was actually loads of scope to improve because you had loads that you could go at to, together as well. So the other three nations looked like they were doing loads better. If I had to guess in 12 months time, this nation might have you know, not, not got up to the same level, but made a disproportionate leap uh, because it was at rock bottom and there was loads to go at. Whilst six months ago, I'd have said, we'll finish the project and then <laughs> we'll get the hell out and we'll never go back. You know, we'll just say, thank you. We're done now and um, it's not going anywhere. So, so there's something about, about being alive to the possibilities, I think, that, that we've learned. Um, we've also had to work with a number of people who have quite um, a transactional uh, view of evidence and, and, and a kind of linear view of evidence so, so, and, and of implementation. So you look at the evidence and it gives you an answer and then you work to implement the answer. And, and on Monday, the answer isn't implemented. And then you implement it, and on Tuesday it is. It, it's quite a kind of linear notion of, of, of it. And we, have, and we found that evidence never gives you an answer. It's always more complicated than that. Uh, and the implementation is an ongoing process of dialogue and, and co-creation. And you take two steps forward and one step back. It's not a one-off event. And the evidence doesn't give you an answer, it gives you a route into, into a conversation and a kind of dialogue and a process of, of co-creation. But, but it, it doesn't give you an answer that you can then just implement. It, it, it's a more kind of evolutionary uh, process than that. For us, it's probably worked best where we've been able to link the evidence up to people's values and their motivations, the lives they want to lead, or the reasons that they came into the job in the, the first place. 
so that um, evidence becomes a, a, a tool to help you do what you're trying to do anyway and to do it better rather than an extra thing that someone is telling you you have to engage with on top of the million and one other things that you already have to engage with. And I don't want to be naive about that. It's much more complicated and, and, and contested. But, but the more that we can link it up to the lives that people want to lead and the things that people came into the job to do, the better. And the example I gave earlier about coming out of um, secure settings for people with learning disabilities is probably a really good example of that. I've never met a doctor or a nurse or a social worker who wants to incarcerate people with learning disabilities in, in locked settings. Um, even the people who I think do before I've met them. <laughs> you know, everyone wants people to come out and to lead better lives in the community. Everyone knows that that's what they should be doing. Um, everyone knows that it's a waste of money to, to, to have all that money tied up in big, secure 24 services when it could be out there in the community keeping people healthy and, uh, and well. People and families want to come out and are frustrated to high heaven. Everyone wants it to be different and wants it to be better. Nobody knows how to do it. And it's really, really hard, which is why we haven't solved it. Yeah, so in that situation, can the evidence help people do something that they have to do anyway and that they want to do anyway a little bit differently and a little bit better so it more genuinely maximises the chance that more people with learning disabilities can come out of those settings and lead more ordinary lives in the, the community. Now, again, that's probably a little bit naive. It's much more uh, complicated than that in the real world. But, but scope to sort of tap into people's values and their, their motivations so that the evidence uh, is aligned and actually is, is a tool to make a difference to help people do what they're already trying to do rather than the kind of burden that you're, you're just saying I know you're really busy John but can you also engage with uh, with this thing as well because that just doesn't work in the reality of a, a very busy uh, busy workplace um, and I was really struck by your um, notion of being prickly which, which I thought was lovely and the diagram was brilliant as well um, we found that sometimes we have to be quite challenging and that it's appropriate that we are and we're independently funded and we're long term funded so you, you know that buys you a degree of ability to be challenging because we're not that beholden to, to, to many people. Um, equally we found you kind of have to earn the right to be prickly as well there's loads of people being prickly to our public services they get it all the time. Um, you know, actually, sometimes you've got to earn the right to be to be to be challenging. By uh, and again, it's the metaphor of a critical friend. You've got to be first and foremost a friend, and people have to perceive you as someone who knows the sector, who likes it, who wants to help. You know, and, and then having those relationships then allows you to sometimes say things that can be difficult to to hear because you've kind of earned the right to uh, to challenge uh, back. Uh, and we've also learned that you have to um, reflect on that balance. So if you're so friendly that, that you, you're never challenged, that then in one sense, you've lost the ability to be independent and critical and to, to kind of add, add value. It, it's not a soft option, but you, you have to earn the right to be challenging sometimes if you want people to actually listen to you and, and still keep listening to you the, the next day. And I guess really close friendships and relationships like, are like that, aren't they? It's not you know, it's not always easy, but, but you've, you've got the relationship there so that you can sometimes st say and work through some quite hard stuff together and ultimately can still be okay the, ne the next day. I, th I think that's what we've learned in terms of our broader policy uh, role. And certainly we've learned from some of our public service colleagues that just being critical makes no difference whatsoever because everyone's critical. Um, actually being a little bit friendly, but then earning the right to, to challenge when it's necessary and picking the, the battles that you, you choose to fight uh, and we've learned that really good leaders in public service really value that because they've got loads of people that tell them what they want to hear. But actually having something independent that helps you just think about things a bit differently really adds value. Uh, and also the people we work with are incredibly bright. I mean, they're much brighter than I am. In one sense, what value do I add? There's nothing I could think of that they, they're not bright enough to think of for themselves. We add value through the, the independence and the ability to take a step back and to be a little bit more critical and to think about things differently. But you have to have the pre-existing relationship in order for, for people to trust you enough for that, that to, be, to be okay. So definitely prickly, but, but sometimes you have to earn the right to be prickly uh, as well, I would argue. I think that's all I was going to say in terms of some of the, the work that we've been doing and um, some of the lessons that we've, we've learned. Um, I'm not sure whether we're doing all of these things very well or not. I, you know, time will, will tell. But, but more important than that, hopefully, it kind of just provides some examples that, that kind of probably prompt questions, you know, either for us in a moment or, or that help you reflect on what you're either doing now or what you want to do uh, differently uh, in future. Uh, but just as I end, and I'll throw open to questions and discussion, if that's okay, Vicky. Uh, 
going back to where I started, we have an internal evaluation framework that helps us try and sort of monitor and learn from what we've achieved. And we also have an external evaluation that's um, commissioned by our funders to uh, try and explore that kind of independently of the centre as well. So we will have loads of formal uh, evidence to, to help us understand what impact we have. Deep down though, if you ask me what success would look like, I can just see a situation in a few years time where a young, possibly naive, possibly very irritating social work student says to a busy, harassed, underpaid, overworked team manager, why do we do it like that? And rather than getting shouted down, they get told, well, we do it like that because there's really good evidence, John, from the research, from people's lived experience, and from our practice knowledge, that it makes a difference to people's lives. Thank you very much.